Hi, welcome. Uh, we are at ESADE Business School and we just finished uh, an elective in creativity and innovation. Uh, we were fortunate to have uh, Bartek Kunowski, uh, the Vice President of Products of uh, Glovo. Glovo is a, a rising star in uh, Barcelona and Spain uh, from the startups that uh, were launched in the last 10 years. And Bartek was talking about how uh, Glovo actually came from the first minimal viable product to uh, a full-blown service that's currently capturing international markets. So uh, we're going to have a conversation about what made Glovo successful. Vartik, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining Thank us. Um, Vartik, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? We have a lot of students here at the SADE and even more broadly people would be quite interesting to know how to get to, to your role, uh, mm. VP Products, uh, successful startup. Yeah. Uh, you know, product is a, it's actually a very interesting career. Uh, it's not something that you can study in university and, and go directly into. Um, so in general, I find, you know, good product managers are ones that have experience and background uh, in, in technology, um, in design, um, understanding uh, user behavior, uh, understanding business needs, and being able to tie all that in together um, and make rational decisions uh, about priorities, about how to do things. Um, and so for me personally, um, you know, I picked up my technology side by, you know, I studied computer science, I was an engineer when I first started. Um, and then very quickly I moved into, uh, I did some consulting work, so I worked a lot with stakeholders and customers, um, and continuing to work with engineers of course. Um, and then um, I started working on some of my own uh, products, I got involved in design um, and then finally moved into my first product management role um, actually at a, a social network uh, so it was a lot of um, it was a consumer product um, a social consumer product which is a very interesting space um, and then finally uh, with more years of experience moved into global um, where, where now I, I run um, all the product development at global so um, the advice really is uh, to get a variety of experience in all the different areas um, and try to be as well-rounded as possible. So uh, getting from engineering to, you know, moving out of engineering and getting the variety of experiences, what was the toughest challenge for you? Oh, well. Um, so I think, I think the toughest challenge is... Um, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you really think about it? I mean, for me, for me, it wasn't very tough. I had it quite clear uh, while I was, you know, in, in the role of as an engineer that I didn't want to spend my entire day uh, in front of a computer. I mean, I still do spend a lot of time of my day in front of a computer, but I had it very clear that I wanted to have more interactions uh, uh, with people. I think um, one of the challenges is when you get away from just interacting with engineers, you discover that there's a lot of uh, people in, in the world um, and people you may interact with that don't really understand how software development works, uh, the struggles of a software engineer, and sometimes the first thing you need, pretty much need to learn is is um, you know the explanations or how you interact with those people is actually completely different than interacting with a, a peer um, engineer, and the way you explain them, you know how things are built or how they're prioritized, um, it, it just differs from stakeholder to stakeholder. Do you have any intuition what would be uh, the challenge that a business person or a graduate from a business school or someone with a management background would have um, in terms of getting from that perspective into your role? Yeah, I think one of the, one of the, the main challenges is understanding how engineering works and how engineers think and what, ma how, what makes engineers tick. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, en engineering world, it's actually, a, it's, it's a, it's, it has its own culture. Um, and uh, it quite tip, it's quite typical to see um, if someone moves into, the, into a product space um, from a purely business background, mm -hmm. it's very difficult for them to gain their respect. 
right. of engineering and to be able to communicate them on a level where they have a very fluid, um, open relationship. Um, and that, that's very, very important because if an, if an enge engineer, if you, if it's very difficult for, for you to assess if what the engineering, if the, the engineer is telling you is true or the estimate he's giving you or she's giving you is, is valid, um, it puts you in a very, let's say, weak position mm -hmm. uh, to be able to make uh, decisions. Right. Uh, not so much a week, but not in, a, in not the best position to, to make decisions. So I think, you know, one of the first areas, if you have a strong business background, that's great. The two areas to really, really focus on improve is both technical and also design. As in, in, interacting with designers is also a completely different mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. You know, great designers, the, the culture, the way they work, the way that, what, what motivates them is completely different mm -hmm. than a business person and an engineer. Right. Um, and the first, the first step is try to figure out how to get experience in those areas. Right. Yeah. Awesome, thanks for that. So I have now uh, another question that concerns Global and Global's uh, track record. Uh, we've seen Global skyrocketing in terms of growth, adoption, international market expansion. Can you share with us from your perspective, from the product's perspective, what was the journey and what were the major uh, milestones and success factors along the way? Yeah, so there's probably a number of success factors. From a, from a product perspective, um, one of our, our biggest, you know, our, 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 our biggest changes that allowed us to, to essentially reach mainstream users uh, was identifying the moment when uh, the, the, the basic product, the MVP product, which was really geared towards um, you know, early adopters, at what point we really needed to you know, um, start focusing on a completely new set of requirements from a new set of users, which is the, the, the majority of the users. And, and for us, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the big you know, eureka moments were, was when we started hearing more and more um, you know, users starting to complain about new things that we hadn't heard about before. And we started hearing a lot of feedback about delivery prices being too high, um, not being able to see and select specific products that they have to type in, um, you know, a, a text field and, and figure out, you know, what, what they can get with the service. Um, and, and those were like telltale signs of a different type of user, mm -hmm. the majority of user. And so um, that was a, you know, w w from in terms of a product development perspective, we started building a whole new set of features specifically focused on th th that set of users, uh, lowering delivery prices through, um, uh, through arranging uh, commercial gr agreements with, uh, with uh, stores and also uh, modifying the user interface of the global product so that users could actually see, um, see and read about the actual um, products that were available in the catalog essentially. Um, so that was a big one you know, from a product perspective. The other thing that's extremely important in, uh, for, for startups to, to, to find this really, really high growth is to find um, traction channels uh, and ideally traction channels that are really, really big and that can last for a really long time and traction channels that don't cost the company a lot of money. Right. And so for us, uh, the, big, the, big, uh, the big one was McDonald's. So, um, you know, we were still a fairly small company um, and we had an opportunity uh, and we, we met with, you know, McDonald's was moving into the delivery space and we, both from a product perspective and from a sales and marketing and everyone in the company put a huge effort to win that initial contract with McDonald's. Um, so we know we, you know, and McDonald's spoke to a whole bunch of other much larger players in the space who really weren't very keen on doing anything special for them. And we went out of our way to even do product, uh, small little product tweaks specifically to, to make uh, McDonald's users feel that they're having a, a more premium experience and hence McDonald's was quite happy with us. Um, and winning that account was, was key to unlocking a lot of growth because it was a massive tr attraction channel. I mean, the, the McDonald's brand is probably one of the most well-known brands in, in the world. I mean, not, not just in Spain, obviously. Um, they have a massive reach in terms of customers um, and you know, a known product uh, that people trust. Um, and so, uh, and so being able to have McDonald's you know, direct their users to, hey, go download the global app to make a McDonald's mm -hmm. purchase, mm -hmm. both in their marketing and their communications and their stores, 
uh, essentially for free. You know, we, we didn't have to pay for that. Um, this was like a massive uh, traction channel for us, uh, which, which uh, allowed us to, to grow our customer base right. really, really quickly. Um, and it was a, you know, for a long period of time, which uh, we ended up replicating in many countries. And of course, um, it wasn't only, only McDonald's, but that was, a, that was like the first really big chain uh, that you know al allowed us to to, to 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 acquire users at a you know very uh, cheap uh, cheap uh, cost, um, and um, and I think those two were like the uh, kind of the biggest. Um, so yeah. I want to come back to your your uh, point on two different Globos, mm -hmm. the first version of Globo, the minimal viable product for early adopters, and yeah. then the one for the early majority. Yeah. Can you tell us what the differences were in terms of the product as well as the user group? Yeah. So the so there's two main differences in the product. So in the in the early adopters product, um, it was we had a flat pricing. So basically every delivery fee was five euros and, and fifty cents, uh, which was just the easy thing to develop, and early adopters were just fine paying for it. And uh, the product was quite basic. It was basically an input box where you can type in and get anything you want. So from a functionality point of view, I mean, it, it pretty much did everything that Global does today. Mm -hmm. Get any product de de delivered in 30 minutes and, and so on and so forth. And for, for early adopters, that was definitely enough. Um, you know, you know the early adopters would tweet about it. And it was an amazing product and, or amazing service, I guess, um, that we were providing to them. Um, but for the, for the next group of users, the early majority, they were, they were a lot less risk averse. They, 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 you know, these are the, the types of people who want to have certainty in their lives. They, they want to know how much something's going to cost in the end. Of course, in the, in the earlier version of, of, of the product, you never knew how much you were going to pay in the end. You knew the delivery fee, but you didn't know how much the final product was going to, was going to cost. It's so only when the product was delivered, you were presented with the final bill. And of course, for, for early adopters, that was fine. But for the, you know, for the, the earlier, late majority users, you know, they wanted to know that up front. They wanted to be able to choose between products. So if they wanted to order you know, a bottle of wine, a red wine, maybe they, that's all they knew. They just mm -hmm. wanted and they wanted to be able to choose between uh, three of them. And so we needed to adapt the product uh, to a first, you know, drop the delivery pricing so that the, you know, when a early majority user made this kind of ROI calculation in their head, it, it felt like a lot more uh, value for the money. Um, and and the second thing is we want we need to create modify the interface of the application in such a way where they would actually see different categories of products and stores with mm -hmm. brands and names of stores that they recognized. Uh, that, that they already had, you know, that they trusted, um, and then within those stores, they actually to see, you know, a, a category listing of products right. uh, that they with prices and, and so on and so forth. And that was kind of the, the two, two main big jumps. Two differences. What's next for Global? Yeah. So uh, one of the nicest, well, one of the nicest things about Global, or one of the fun things about Global, is, well, most product companies actually they typically start off with a with a, a niche. And they try to find uh, some kind of market fit, and then once they do that fairly well, and, and they and they dominate that maybe that small niche, then they, they expand the scope of the service. Mm -hmm. um, and Global actually does has done things upside down. So even in the in the most basic basic first version of the product, I mean it was extremely extremely simple from like a you know, technical or software development point of view, but the scope of the service was massive in the sense that you can get anything delivered from any store in 30 minutes. So it's like it's a massive scope on day one. Um, and the nice thing of having such a massive scope is that there's plenty of things to do. Um, so, you know, we, you know, we are, uh, you know, we we are in investing in different verticals. Uh, so we have. Uh, you know, right now, what, one of the big areas that we're focusing on is something called Super Globo. So we're going to be, uh, we already launched in Madrid and soon in Barcelona. Uh, basically, we're going to have what we call dark, uh, dark supermarkets. So this is basically industrial spaces embedded in, in, within the city, and you'll be able to get, you know, your your weekly or your your every two three day grocery uh, shopping, you know, delivered to your to your house in less than half an hour. You know, for a price that's much less than any other online uh, grocery uh, shopping service. So we're doing quite a bit, big investment there, and we're also going to be expanding to other verticals as well. 
um, you know, in the future. So one of the, one of the areas we're looking at, you know, is is the micro mobility uh, space. Um, you can, but other areas as well. We may, may at some point do some kind of on-demand laundry service. Um, there's lots of things. We're also expanding a lot geograph uh, geographically. Um, so you know, most people don't know, but you know, we're in a lot of countries in Latin America and um, in Africa now in the Middle East. So there's plenty of to do there uh, to do there as well. Sounds so fascinating. The, today you joined the class on on creativity and innovation and. You, you gave great feedback to students. Uh, thank you very much for that. I mean, we're looking to work more with companies uh, and, and integrate more realistic experience mm -hmm. in the classroom and at the same time give back. Uh, any thoughts on how we could do that together? Uh, in global in particular or in general, like uh, in general? Whatever you... Whatever, wherever ideas come from. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's a, Barcelona has a very vibrant, um, you know, startup space community, and and I think you know a, a lot of these companies, um, you know, are very keen to meet you know talented, um, you know, people who have a business, a strong business background, who are interested in you know um, in maybe trying a new adventure. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, in terms of attracting this, you know, reaching out to some of these startups, you know, um, in Barcelona, um, you know, and, and to their CEOs or whoever it is, you know, VPs of product or marketing people mm -hmm. um, and giving them the opportunity to come in and, and tell their story. I think it's quite an attractive, mm -hmm. an attractive um, proposition, especially, you know, since, the, you know, the reputation of the university is, you know, it's, it's, it's quite, quite well known. So uh, I think for them, that might be an interesting, uh, for some startups might be an interesting interesting avenue um, and that's that one of the benefits that maybe you'll be able to get um, and I think uh, from your side I think any the, the more variety of you know startups that you mm -hmm. guys speak to and um, businesses the more insights you get about you know uh, you know the various stories and the paths they took to, to get to any kind of success they're at. Cool. Bartek thank you again um, thanks for joining us today in the classroom and thanks for this interview uh, we'll be staying in touch of course okay thank for you very much. opportunities